Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by RJR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. By New Home, changing the way America sews. By Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wish Book. By American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. By Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. And by Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of polyfill brand products for crafting. Hi, we've got a great beginner block for you today and also with some sophisticated possibilities. Today's log cabin. It's my favorite quilt because I first got interested in quilts with log cabin. It's kind of a foolproof block and by that I mean all you need to do is find out how to make the block, which we'll show you, and then you can put some together. And it's how you put them together that makes the difference. All you need to remember with a log cabin is lights and darks or some kind of color differentiation. This is a block I bought in New York quite a while ago. I couldn't afford the quilt, so I just bought the block. La Diane and Laura have got some mass production methods that they're going to be showing you in a little bit, but I wanted you to get a real idea for a little bit of the history of log cabin design. Over here, we consider it to be telling you something about the strips in the log cabin. But over in England, they sometimes consider it an uh, overview of tiled fields. The strips in the quilt block are what you can think of as the stacked logs that are making up the cabins. This particular log cabin was built just about half a mile from where I'm sitting now and would have been about from the time when log cabin quilts became so popular that they had special exhibitions devoted just to them at county fairs. You'll notice that we are pretty proud of how tall we can grow our corn around here. By the 1880s, as log cabin quilts reached the height of their popularity, people were already beginning to romanticize the idea of being a pioneer and living in what they considered a quaint log cabin. But for earlier women, pioneering was really a grim reality rather than a romantic adventure, as we can hear in their diary notations. Oh dear, I do want to get there. It is now almost four months since we have slept in a house. We camped that night. My husband stopped the team and said, Mary, did you ever see anything so beautiful? There was nothing in sight but nature, nothing except a little mud and stick hut. Women told their diaries of how they really didn't want to move, but they really had no choice. They either followed their husbands or they were left behind. One woman who'd been a child when her family moved to Kansas in 1878 recalled her mother's reaction to the first sight of their new home. When our covered wagon drew up beside the door of the one-roomed house that father had provided, he helped mother down and I remember how her face looked as she gazed about that barren farm then threw her arms about his neck and gave way to the only fit of weeping I ever remember seeing her indulge in. You've got to remember that many of these women had grown up in the East in large, airy homes of two and three stories. Imagine her feelings when she first saw the log cabin. She thought it was a joke, or perhaps he was showing her a barn. But no, this was to be their home. We are living in a log house. And although we've made it tolerable, comfortable, it is not what we could wish it to be. The typical log cabin was probably smaller than the room you're now sitting in. The houses were made of long logs, which were notched at the ends to fit over one another. When the walls were in place, any cracks between the logs were stuffed with sticks and mud, and then the door and window were cut out. A quilt was sometimes hung at the doorway to keep out drafts until a real door could be made, 
and it might also be hung between beds to provide privacy. Women took pains to make their cabins as cozy and cheerful as possible. They carefully arranged their furniture in boxes to maximize space, and they decorated the walls with newspapers, pictures cut from magazines, whatever they had, and covered dirt floors with rag rugs. But usually, it was the quilts they brought with them, the same quilts that had padded precious dishes and other fragile items on the trip that provided the brightest color in the cabins once they were settled. Now the real fun of the log cabin block is all you have to do is make all of these individual blocks. You really can't do any wrong because it's by seeing the block and turning it and twisting it since it's an asymmetrical block that you get all of these really complicated beautiful designs that you don't need to think up ahead of time. So I wanted to give you a real idea of how the variety works with quilts. I've got some quilts to show you from the collection of Robert and artist James. It's not that they particularly specialize in log cabin quilts. They've got 500 quilts, so I had a lot to choose from. So just look at what beautiful designs you can get with these easy blocks. See what I mean by the design variations? It allows you to do all kinds of things. Here's one more variation. Courthouse steps. The block's divided in quarters rather than in halves. So if you're ready to get started, Diana and Laura will show you that it's not really tricky. You just have to follow it step by step. I've got this some organized here too. Quilt. Hi, Diana and I are going to be making a log cabin block today. I'd like you to come over here for just a minute so you can take a look at the 12 inch log cabin block that we've put into our scrap sampler quilt. The log cabin is one of my favorites because it just happens to be the very first quilt that I ever made. Take a look at the block here and you can see that there are six light fabrics and six dark fabrics. And I've arranged them here with the center fabric. From the center fabric, you'll need to cut three, three and a half mm -hmm. inch squares. And I say three because I know you're looking at this and thinking, well, there's only one there, but if you purchase, a quarter of a yard from each of your fabrics, you'll be able to easily make four blocks. And then from your strips, you will cut two inch square uh, strips. Mm, that's right, and you can use either your quick cutting tools or a pair of scissors, whichever you prefer. Let's play a little bit with these strips so we can organize them into this a... This is the fun about the log cabin is that you can really get with it as far as designing and where you're going to put the strips. And that's right, you've got two I picked lights. Up number one two darks. And you can switch these around and put them wherever you want them, but notice that now I've started building. There we go. Two more lights. See how Diana's building around in a, in a counterclockwise motion? There I'm going go. right around the hearth of the home, taking my logs to build this log cabin. This takes just just a minute to do, but it's so important because... Let's put that one there and right. maybe this one. Well, or you could switch it around. Whatever is your choice. There you Sometimes go. this medium works very well on the light side. It's fun to throw in something a little different. I think it adds more interest to the block. Oh, that's Now great. we want to uh, make sure, though, that we have this nice light area and dark. Serve, check it out. We also want to make sure that this doesn't get out of order because you might have a kitty or a baby <laughs> or somebody that comes up. Or the up telephone <laughs> rings. Or the telephone, that's right. Let's okay. go ahead and place our numbers as we have them around the hearth of our home. That's right. So We've we'll got just this keep numbered going around. One to twelve, because remember there are twelve strips and we're working and right we'll around. And just continue. Now I have them already numbered over at my uh, sewing surface here. With number one on the top. Right. And I'm going to put a rubber band around these because this just keeps all of these strips together and I will just lay them in my lap and bring up strip number one. You can go ahead and put it right under your sewing uh, surface with the right side up. Then I will take my center, place it on, 
and lower presser foot and start sewing one quarter of an inch. This method of chaining your log cabins are just so quick and fast because notice that I'm adding all of the centers. If I would have 48 blocks, I would add 48 centers. Which means that if you have finished one block, you've finished all your blocks. And we'll just keep going until we have our centers on and then I'm going to give them to you. Okay. So you can just... Great. I've got one here ready to go. Notice I've placed the strip number one on the top. Give it a nice flat press and then fold strip one over the seam line. They go clockwise. Cut these apart. It's important at this point. Take time to, to cut and to press as you go because these need not only to be separated as units, but you need to square them up. Can you see here what's happened? Now I have all of these units ready to be attached to strip number two. And I'm going to place the strip number one right at the top so that when I put it on my strip number two, I have that right here on the top. Let's me put a let's put a couple more on here just so I can show you exactly what this looks like so that it's ready then to seam all the way down. And now I'm ready to press and cut. Here we go. Ready to go? Again, square it off. If you'll take time to do this, you'll notice that it's so hard to make a mistake with this block. They always come out just perfect. These now are ready to be attached to strip number three. This is my strip number three and again, notice that the strip number two is at the top and I will just quickly place these on and then it is just a matter of sewing, pressing and squaring them up. And you will continue then with strip number four, five, six, until you have strip number 12. Let's show you some of the design possibilities that come from the log cabin. All of the blocks are made exactly the same way, and so the different settings and arrangements are made simply by turning and twisting the blocks around. Take a look at this one here. We call this the straight furrows or streak of lightning. See the white strip running through it? And dark. the dark strip going down this way. Let's turn these around just a little bit so we have... Put the uh, darks in the middle? Yeah, put the darks in the center. Then you have what we call a light and dark variation, which is the quilt in the back of us. This is a very graphic design. And you can play around with these blocks and turn them any direction that you would like. Let's take a look at some of the other variations we have in the full-size quilts. This one's a barn raising. That's right. It's called barn raising. It starts here with the lights in the center and it builds out forming these beautiful diamonds. Now you don't need to choose 13 fabrics like our last quilt, but maybe just choose five. Two lights, two darks, and a wonderful yellow center. Let's take a look here at this. Oh, this border is just wonderful. Look at it. It just almost looks like a little zigzag or a rickrack framing the quilt. I love the corner treatment here. It's just great. Here's another old one. It's nice to have these old quilts in my collection because our, uh, our students just enjoy them so much because they get design possibilities from these. Mm -hmm. Can you see here in the center, it's not, a square has not been used, but instead we have two triangles, giving it just a little bit of a variation in the design. And the light center going dark, light, dark. This repetition of this design makes it so graphic and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this one. Speaking oh. of graphic and wonderful, oh. look at this one. Wow. <laughs> this one was made by Dina Canty. This is a feast for the eyes. This is taken from the zigzag variation. Of course, she's changed it a little bit, 
But that's what's so wonderful about the log cabin is that you can place them in any direction and make the designs you want. That's right. Can you see here when we talk about light sides and dark sides, notice that she has placed some dark fabrics on the light side. However, it still reads as a light side. And there's light, dark, light, dark. We hope you'll have fun playing with them and making several of your own. I, I think you could just go on for days making the, yes. the log cabin. Just allow yourself a log cabin design experience. I love that really graphic quilt by Dina Canty with those strong black and whites. Here is another great adaptation. That's the fun thing about log cabins is you can do so many different things with prints. This is by Mary Jo Dalrymple who has, oh, she moved to Omaha a couple of years ago. Mary Jo's got this great smoky voice when you talk to her on the phone. I love her voice. Look at this pineapple adaptation. Now the pineapple is a block that, as you can see, she started with some basic log cabins. And then if you see some little points coming out that look like they're pineapples, well, that's a block that came out of the basic design when quilts started getting a little more complicated about the 1890s. And we'll be talking more about that on a later show. But you can see that she it's just a little bit more complicated version. And it's great for doing it all kinds of colors. I can whip this one off so you can see another kind of pineapple in one of her later quilts. She did this a couple years ago. The, I've got this one folded here. My director, Paul, said he definitely wants that quilt. So Mary Jo, when I send these back to you, please be sure that uh, you look for that one in the box and make sure he hasn't got it. This is one that I would take home definitely. It's by Terry Mangott. Terry has used such gorgeous fabric in this quilt. I want you to look, do you see something that looks um, like gold? It's frustrating to me because I'd like to be able to say, you know, beam them down, Scotty. You can't see on your TV what I can see right here looking at it, and it's just gorgeous. This fabric here is actually spun gold that goes all the way around this figure. If you think you're seeing things in this quilt, you're right because she actually has two figures incorporated into this log cabin. Terry's quilts are always interesting to look at really close up because she combines material that's $200 a yard with material that she got for 39 cents a yard at Woolworths. So you look at them and you continually get these little surprises. And she was also one of the first people to start using sequins and beads. They always remind me of when I was at my grandmother's when I was a young girl and my grandmother used to have a drawer that had all kinds of sequins and beautiful fans in it and I get that kind of sense looking at Terry's quilts because they're full of really exotic materials. I think a quilt like this really says something about this time period. If I had to pick one quilt that I thought might be really evocative of what was going on today and still have tradition in it, it would be Terry's. Now just when you think that you know how to put together a log cabin, I'm going to show you one other method because it's an old method. The log cabin was so popular that lots of different styles developed in doing it. And this is a foundation block method. It was an old style. What you're seeing here is actually the foundation backing. The, this fabric is sewn directly onto this rather than being seamed this is all worn away and just the remaining stitches exist. And I'm going to put this aside because I want to show you what you can do with this method. This is a little quilt by Leslie Claire Greenberg. And when I saw Leslie had this, I thought from the front, how on earth did you do this with so many little tiny pieces if she had to cut out each one of those individual pieces? But she showed me a tricky way that she's developed and she does have patterns available for this of printing, actually stamping, the sewing order on this block. So this is where I feel a little bit like one of those Vegematic salespeople that goes through the demonstration. I'm going to try to show you in a clear way how she does this, because it's a neat trick. She has these stamps. She has them in lots of different sizes. And then she stamps on the sewing order. Then with this she turns it over 
and just puts a square on it. Now, it doesn't have to be a certain size. You can put it roughly so that it is a little bigger than this. The next step is to add the first strip. She adds it on this side so that when she sews it, this is going to be this side, so don't get confused. There's a number one here, and she just sews this strip right along number one, turns it over, presses it, and she has this already forming. Then she adds the second strip. This is the same kind of thing, Laura and Diana, were showing you. You go around the block, but it's a way of doing it very quickly without measuring this is the next strip, and so on and so on, folding this back and adding piece after piece after piece. And it isn't that it's a better method, it's just a little different method, and what you end up with, down at the bottom, is this, which she's used. You've probably been seeing this in the background and saying, bring over that vest so I can see it. Here is those little tiny pieces in this quilt. So it's a great other kind of technique that you should know about. And I wanted Rod to take a little look at this old quilt that I showed you before. This is a quilt I bought sight unseen just because I love log cabins. And as you can see, it needs a little work on it. This is a quilt that I actually bought sight unseen because I wanted a log cabin. I yeah, love I'd, log cabins. I do too. It's, it's one of my favorite patterns. The story behind this one is someone wrote me and they said a, they had a log cabin and they wanted very little money for it. And so I said, yes, but I hadn't even seen it. So I got it and it's in very bad shape, but well, it looks like I love a well, it anyway. It looks like a well-worn friend. Yeah, it is. And I should have known that you can't get something for very little and have it be a real masterpiece. It has got a lot of wear on here. Log cabin is such a, a strong pattern anyway that even with, with these worn pieces, the strength of the pattern still comes out. And um, this one's so wonderful with these beautiful, strong yeah, reds that. in that it, it just gives and it so purples. much strength. It's been one of my favorite patterns since I first started collecting and buying quilts as a dealer. I, mean, I just found some wonderful log cabins. You had cabins. a gorgeous one that makes me, reminds me of this one. You had a gorgeous one about 15 years ago that yeah. I would have loved to have bought, but I didn't have the money. And tell me a little bit about the dating of log cabins in general. Well, the pattern probably originated sometime in the 1860s. We've never discovered like the first log cabin yeah. or when the pattern was actually published. But as a general rule, it appears in the 1870s. That's when you'll start seeing 1880s up to the 1900s. But of course, log cabins were made from then on. My grandmother mm -hmm. made a beautiful log cabin in the, in the 1930s, mm -hmm. you know, pastel fabrics. You don't see too many in the 30s. You don't. Yeah. Um, you're going to mo mostly see them, as I said, in that 1870 to 1900 range. So that would be what where this fits? I think so, definitely. You um, see a lot of them in the 1970s and 80s then. They were really popular. And the log cabin pattern is I think, the quintessential American quilt. It just is so evocative of just the name and the association with the frontier and the log cabin and, mm -hmm. and settling this country, that it really is one of the quilts that people most think of when they think of an American quilt is the log cabin. There, um, it was such a great favorite, I think because of the strength of the design, don't you? Definitely. So? You notice this one's tied. A lot of them, well actually a, a log cabin isn't it's rarely quilted. Mm -hmm. They generally. We've been looking at strips all day, so I wanted to end by taking a look at what's been happening over the past 10 years, which is people, surprising as it sounds if you're not used to this, they cut up strips, they sew them together, almost like making a strip fabric, and then they cut them apart and re sew them again. So you'll see what I mean when we look at these. Esther Parkhurst actually cut a whole quilt up. Well, what happened was that she had worked on a large quilt top for about three months, 
and when she got it done, she didn't like it very much. So one day, she just cut the whole quilt top into long strips and then re-sewed these strips together, making an entirely new design. And she liked that one much better than the first. Esther's from Los Angeles. Nancy Herman from Marion, Pennsylvania is a painter as well as a quilt maker. She describes her paintings and quilts as translations of music. To her, the print fabrics represent musical chords, while the solids are single notes. So let's listen. As future quilt historians look back at the quilts of our time, they'll credit Michael James with having a major influence. Michael was the first contemporary quilt maker I know to have a traveling museum retrospective of his work and to teach and exhibit internationally. Of all his quilts, this little piece is my favorite. It's now in the collection of artisan Robert James, whose antique log cabin quilts we looked at earlier in the program. Michael's from Somerset Village, Massachusetts. I love the nervous energy I feel running through the quilts of Petra Sosman from Kansas City. Isn't this a beautifully strange one? Here she's used silky fabrics to represent the light as if this forest was indeed phosphorescent. And what's in this woods? What are those tail or tentacle things approaching around the quilt's edge? Next week, Marilyn Monroe is going to be with us, if you will believe that, in a quilt.